Hello and welcome to another episode of Team Blush, now in Ultra HD and in 60 FPS. This is episode 12 of the KA24 E Turbo series, and as you can see on this table, we have a lot to do. In this episode, we are going to be installing these AEM gauges in the car. We are going to be tackling mounting up this intercooler as well as routing our intercooler piping through the engine bay. And as well on this table, you can see that we have some exhaust components for fabrication. We are actually not going to be doing anything with that this episode. We have gone ahead and decided to release the reins on getting our downpipe and our wastegate dump fabricated. We just looked at the clearances that we're dealing with in the end of the last episode and we neither have the skill nor the tools required to do it ourselves. So we are actually going to get a mobile fabricator to come to where we are working out of and fabricate that for us. There is also a few other small things to do like making a master brake cylinder heat shield as well as getting the turbo wrapped with a turbo blanket that has just come in the mail. There's going to be a lot done in this episode. Follow along. We're going to get right to it. I think the first thing we're going to do is get these gauges installed so that we know where we need to put our bung for our O2 sensor in the downpipe. So without further ado, let's get to work and we will see you there. The first thing that we're going to do to tackle in getting our gauges installed in the car is to set up their gauge pods. During this process, we knew we were going to be working underneath the dashboard for extended periods of time. So we went ahead and just took the seats out of the car and pulled the trim panels necessary to do the job. It allowed us a ton more room to work and it gave us necessary space for the camera as we went ahead and filmed everything. If you're following along at home and are taking the driver's seat out of your S13, something to keep in mind is to take care of this small wire attached to the underside of it. Make sure you don't pull that. Strangely enough, this was the first time we actually ever took the driver's seat out of this car and we didn't even think to check for it. This is also pretty common on most vehicles. So again, if you're taking the driver's seat out of really any vehicle, just make sure you don't pull any wires that might be underneath it. The gauge pods we're installing require the removal of the trim around the gauge cluster. So our next steps were to get the underside of the dash pulled apart. This includes the removal of the dash underside tray, which is held on by seven bolts underneath. The trunk latch cable bracket that holds onto it is a simple two bolt affair. And from there, we did things a little backwards than we probably should have. We went ahead and removed the clamshell around the steering column. I believe there's six screws holding that together. At that point, it probably would have been better to drop the steering column because later on here in the footage, you can see we have a little bit of trouble getting the gauge cluster trim off. But then after that, we moved on to pulling our headlight, our hazard, and our defrost buttons off of the gauge cluster trim. From what we're aware, you can't pull any of the other buttons off like this. So from the back side, you have to really delicately unplug all of the other four or five buttons. And that should allow you to pull the gauge trim off when the time comes. From there, two screws on the top side of the gauge trim piece hold it in. And then once those two screws are undone, it can be pulled out from the dash. If you're having a little bit of trouble playing the game of Tetris to get it out, you can go underneath the dash and undo the four bolts holding the steering shaft to the underside of the dash. That should make things a ton easier. 
With our gauge trim out of the dash and on our workbench, we can now showcase our really cool new gauge pods. These are from a small, somewhat local shop called Breakbeat, and we wanted to bring attention to them because it doesn't seem like many people actually know about them. These gauge pods are a super smart design, and they replace the hand warmer vents in the gauge cluster trim. And once they're installed, they look like an OEM option. They are matched to the same color as the surrounding trim, and they even have texture like you would see on an OEM Nissan part. This is super smart as well. Breakbeat even supplies these little plugs for the hand vent ducting underneath the vent once you've gone ahead and deleted it. In theory, this should increase the amount of warm air coming from the remaining vents in the car. So just because you're deleting your hand warmer vents, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're negatively affecting the efficiency of the heating system in the car by pumping that heat wastefully into your dash. It is just being relocated to the other vents in your car. We are going to leave a link in the description of this video for their site and for complete transparency we are not sponsored by them. We purchased these gauge pods on our own. We just think these pods are such a good idea. They're executed really well and they fit perfectly with that OEM plus aesthetic and style that we're striving for in this vehicle. It's really simple to get them installed, starting first by removing the hand vents, which are held in with two screws. And then from there, it's a little nerve wracking, but you have to index the bottom edge of the pod in with the hole where the vent was located. Then you apply downward and forward pressure on the actual gauge pod itself. With that pressure, it should snap the upper claws of the gauge pod into place with that indexing hole where the vent was. It's a really snug fit, so just be careful when you're pressing these into place if you do end up purchasing these yourself. Here's how they look once they are both installed, and here's a general idea of how they're going to look once we install our AEM gauges into them. They're sized for 52 millimeters, which is a slip fit for our AEM gauges, but also come in a 60 millimeter variant for other brands. Next, let's go ahead and take a look at how to install the plugs for our heater vent ducting. You'll have two vent ducts sitting underneath the gauge cluster that fed the hand warmers. These are extremely brittle, but they are simply slip fit into the vent ducts and are easily removed with just a quick tug. From there, we can get a better look further into the area under the dash where you can take your vent plugs that break peat supplies and simply push them over the duct. You'll want the small notch in the plug to be on top when installing these. Before going about reinstalling our gauge trim piece with our new gauge pods and gauges into the car, we have to go about running our gauge sensor wiring through the firewall and underneath the dashboard. A lot of the footage for this we didn't capture just to how precarious wire management under the dashboard itself and through the engine bay is, but we still wanted to show that we ended up fishing our oil pressure and our boost gauge wiring through this little grommet in the firewall. This is where the hood latch cable runs through. Our boost gauge sensor stayed unhooked for now since we have yet to install our waste gate or our boost control solenoid. And for our oil pressure gauge, we had to thread in a little oil pressure sensor into our oil filter sandwich plate that was installed in a previous video in the series. There was actually just enough length to run the supplied wiring from the underside of the dash through that grommet that we just showed and to this location. Moving on to our air fuel ratio gauge, we decided to route its wiring a little bit differently because of how we're going to be powering it and how we're going to be wiring it into our standalone Megasquirt ECU. We tucked the portion of the wire that runs to the O2 sensor along the small shelf area of the firewall and just temporarily situated the sensor itself near the area we plan to put our O2 bung in our downpipe. 
The wiring provided for this gauge was much longer than the other two gauges, so it spanned perfectly through that grommet in the passenger side wheel well, and then fed throughout the underside of the dashboard perfectly back to the AFR gauge itself, and also to our Megasquirt ECU. From here, we had all of our gauge wiring routed mostly where it needed to go and could plug them into the back of the gauges and get them installed in their mounts. And with that, we could also start getting things put back together. Before we knew about the brake beat gauge mounts, we had purchased this ATI steering column gauge mount. We'll be using it for the time being for our third gauge. It's a cheap alternative for now, but in the future we have our eyes on this really cool gauge pod setup that we want to bring light to. And that's this awesome dash molded three pod setup from something different engineering. It's another small company and it doesn't seem like a lot of people know about this gauge pod solution. We haven't gotten our hands on it yet so we can't speak for the quality but we know it's built in that OEM styling. It's the same color as the dash and it has that similar texturing. We just thought it was worth mentioning if you are looking for gauge pod mounting solutions for yourself. And we'll throw a link down in the description below of where you can go pick that up. Again, not sponsored, just thought it was a really smart solution to mounting gauges in the S13. The only wiring required under the dash for our boost and our oil pressure gauges was for power and ground, so it made things super easy. Since our standalone Megasquirt ECU will be seeing the boost pressure through its map sensor, we don't need to actually wire our boost gauge into our ECU. So we ended up using a heat shrinking solar connector to combine the positive wires of both gauges together and then installing them onto a fuse tap. This is just a little small link that allows us to add an extra fuse 12 volt connection lead to the fuse box and we're going to be using the fuse box in the driver's side footwell. We ended up doing a similar setup for our two ground wires for the gauges. We combined these into a singular ring terminal and then protected them with a piece of heat shrink. Once our wiring was all set up and ready to go, we looked at our fuse box lid to get an idea of where we wanted to go ahead and place our fuse tap. The fuse that we need to tap into needs to be switched power, so it needs to only be on when the car is on. And ideally, it needs to be an accessory fuse that isn't necessary to the function of the vehicle, should something go wrong while installing or in the future. We personally decided on tapping our wiper washer fuse. It seemed like the best idea and we went ahead and located our ground connection right nearby. Our air fuel ratio gauge was wired in a little bit differently since we needed to feed its sensor data into our Megasquirt ECU. The plug and play variant of the DIY AutoTune Megasquirt has a 26 pin port on the back for pinning in data powering and even grounding accessories that you might add to your mega squirt. They even provide the necessary DIY connector and pigtail wiring already pinned out to make adding accessories even easier. We only ended up videoing the full process of one of these wires for our AFR getting pinned into the connector, but it's the same process for all of them. You'll take the associating wire, 
splice a pinned pigtail onto it, identify which pin it correlates to, and then securely insert the pin into the connector. We ended up having to pin four wires, and we'll toss up on the screen right now which color wires were pinned to what location so you can get an idea if you are looking for that information. Once our AFR gauge was pinned out to the connector, we plugged it into our mega squirt. And all that needed to get done after that was to install the ECU back into its harness connector and turn the key to test that our gauges were all functioning. Here is about how everything is going to look to us when we are driving the car with the gauges in their gauge pods. We think it looks really cool, it's almost like being in a fighter jet or something. And for now, you can also see that the boost gauge isn't currently reading out correctly. That's just because our sensor isn't currently hooked up. As you can see, hooking it up results in proper functionality. The same goes for our AFR gauge over on the right. With the O2 sensor hooked up, it functions properly. So once we get our downpipe fabricated, get that threaded in and then installed, it will be working correctly. Speaking of the downpipe getting fabricated, here is the aftermath of the mobile fabricator working his magic. We opted not to film the process of it all. The space that we were working in is already small, so you can imagine what it was like with another person, a welder, an argon bottle, cords and exhaust material scattered everywhere. We'd actually recommend that if you want to check out the welding that was done to this downpipe and some other things to go check out the fabricator's Instagram. We'll post it up on the screen right now. Super cool guy. He owns a sick competition spec S13 and it was really patient with all of the extra stuff we ended up throwing at him. At the end of the day, he ended up fabricating our downpipe with a recirculated wastegate dump and flex joints, a midpipe to bridge our downpipe to our catalytic converter. He drilled and welded a boost reference port onto our turbo because ours didn't come with one. He helped in extending a piece of our intercooler piping that you'll see later on. And finally, he welded in the intake air temperature sensor bung for our intercooler piping that you'll see in the next episode. So yeah, it really goes without saying that his help was priceless in getting this project done in a timely manner. At the end of the last episode, we were worried about our downpipe being too close to our AC line, our brake master cylinder, and our brake lines. So before we go installing this downpipe into the car, we need to wrap it with our first stage of heat mitigation. The old CX Racing bolt-on turbo kits for the KA24E never really mentioned having to do anything special in reference to that AC line. So given that kit had a downpipe that wasn't wrapped, our wrapped downpipe should be more than fine. As for our brake master cylinder and our brake lines, however, we'll do some more heat mitigation a bit later in this episode. Our next step in the order of operations required us to get our wastegate set up and installed on the car. Since our downpipe has that recirculated wastegate dump, the wastegate needs to be put on first. This is a genuine tile 44mm wastegate and we will be initially setting it up with only a 5 pound spring. Depending on what date a tile wastegate is manufactured depends on what color of springs it will have shipped with it and what you will use for it. Here's a little bit more information on that. Ours was manufactured after 2012, so we will be using a red spring for our desired 5 PSI. We are setting up the wastegate to be controlled with a two port boost controller solenoid. So we installed one barbed fitting onto the lower portion of the wastegate and we installed one barbed fitting on the top. All of the other ports for air, we blocked off with the supplied grub screws from Tile, and all of the ports for the cooling with coolant were left open. To install the spring itself, it's a pretty simple matter. You just take the lid off of the wastegate held in with six hex bolts. 
And with that lid off, you can place and index that spring into the grooves inside of the wastegate. The lid will go back on after that and when you're putting the lid on just be careful not to pinch that orange diaphragm with the lid as you put it back on and depending on how heavy of a spring you choose to run in your wastegate you may have to use a vise to help get the lid back on the tile wastegate has a v-band style flange on both sides so if you decide like us to use a rev9 exhaust manifold you'll need to get a two bolt to v-band adapter flange and when getting this flange something to keep in mind is that when we originally got ours we had an issue with the adapter not seating the wastegate valve closed when we tried to install it we can't say it for certain, unfortunately, which adapter will work because in our case we had the mobile fabricator mix up some of the parts we had laying around to fabricate a properly working one. Really quickly here, we mentioned in the end of the last episode that we were worried about not being able to retain our air conditioning because the oil return from the turbo was coming into contact with the line underneath it. We were luckily able to remedy this by simply clocking the turbo ever so slightly to the side. Ideally, you want your oil return line to be at absolutely 12 o'clock since the oil is only pulled by gravity out of the turbo. But we're going to go out on a limb here, take a chance and say that we're more than likely fine with this angle and it was able to go ahead and clear that line from the AC. Finally, with our wastegate assembled, we could begin piecing things together on the engine side of things. Like we said earlier, the wastegate is held on with a two bolt flange that adapts to a V-band. Then on the downpipe side, the wastegate is also held on with a V-band once we get it all maneuvered into place. That was so ridiculously hard to get to that we did not film it. We were completely in the frame the entire time while trying to wrestle with that. While under the car though, we did get a good look of how tight the clearances are for our downpipe and take a look at that. That's pretty impressive stuff. There's no way that we would have been able to do anything like that with our fabrication skills. So again, that mobile fabricator came in clutch. And then finally, the O2 sensor for our air fuel ratio gauge threaded perfectly into place once we got our downpipe installed and was at the perfect angle. At this point, we could get a better look at how close our brake lines were located next to our wrapped downpipe and the clearance that we'd be seeing for our brake master cylinder. For our second stage of heat mitigation, we went about wrapping our brake lines with this design engineering heat wrap stuff we absolutely do not recommend at all that you purchase this stuff. While it should help shield heat from our brake lines, this stuff was an absolute pain to work with. Theoretically, it wraps whatever line you're wanting to shield from heat and then self adheres with a strip of adhesive built into a flap on it. But the adhesive doesn't work in the slightest and we ended up just having to hose clamp both ends to keep it from unwrapping from the brake lines whenever we let go of it. Just stay away. There are probably better options to get these brake lines wrapped so we highly recommend doing some research and finding something else. Our third stage of heat mitigation is this simple turbo blanket and this should contribute the most to all of our tactics in trying to keep our braking components safe from the heat of the turbo. Then finally for our last stage of heat mitigation we needed to fabricate some sort of heat shield for our brake master cylinder. This didn't turn out looking the greatest and we ended up having to cut out some portions of it to clear our brake lines. But with the heat tape and all of the steps we took for heat mitigation, we think this setup should be adequate enough to keep things safe. In the future, we'll probably look at buying some low profile banjo bolt brake lines like these ones over at Chase Bays that should get our lines a bit further away from the downpipe and behind the heat shield. And we'll probably also switch to a dot for brake fluid for our braking system. And that will help by raising the boiling point of our brake fluids. 
now let's begin taking a look at getting our intercooler mounted and our intercooler piping routed. Again, with basing our setup off of the old CX Racing Turbo Kit, we seen that this was kind of their solution for mounting an intercooler. We ended up taking a piece of scrap metal that was lying around in the garage that totally wasn't just a cut up piece of shelving. And this made for a really good length to bolt on two L brackets onto it. Again, those L brackets that we bolted onto it were just some scrap metal laying around in the garage. And admittedly, none of it looked all that great, but in the end, it very securely mounts the intercooler exactly where we need it. And it also clears the Street Faction bash bar that we installed in a previous episode on the channel. If you remember in the previous episode while we were prepping the engine bay and getting things ready for our intercooler piping, we found this hole in the driver's side of the engine bay that was seemingly going to be perfect for our intercooler piping, but ended up being just too small. In order to enlarge this hole, we used a 3 inch hole saw on a drill and then used a piece of wood that we jacked up underneath the hole to act as a guide so that our hole saw didn't walk on us when we were going ahead and drilling this hole out larger. This was at least the theory of operation and it worked out somewhat well. You might try and find some better ways to do this because it didn't turn out as nice as we'd hoped. In the end, we had to go in with a carbide bit to kind of clean up the edges as best as we could. Those edges will need to get finished up with some paint to keep things from rusting. And then we also went ahead and used some vacuum line cut in half to act as a grommet to keep our intercooler piping from touching the edges. We unfortunately had to drill another hole and do much of the same to the other side of the engine bay. After mocking up our piping off camera while the mobile fabricator was working his magic, we figured out our original hole just wasn't going to work out with the way that things were lining up. Let us be a lesson, don't drill your intercooler piping holes until you know exactly where they need to be. Luckily this piece of sheet metal here is something we planned on replacing in the future, so it wasn't too much of a heartbreak to drill another hole in it. With the engine bay now actually prepped this time around, we could finally end off our night by rummaging through our box of intercooler piping and start piecing things together. And during this process, you won't see any hose clamps getting put on. We'll go ahead and get those put on off camera. Ideally, we'd like to get this all welded up properly in the future because originally we didn't really think that intercooler piping would be all that important, so we just ended up picking up a universal kit on eBay. That being said, after seeing the fit on some of the portions of this system that we put together, we would probably have been better to try and track down the CX Racing intercooler kit for the KA24E or had something custom fabricated. This kit might get trimmed up in spots somewhat off camera as well, depending on how well it holds up to some of those weird angles and if those couplers are going to pop off with excessive boost pressure. Until then, it really should be fine enough to hold up to 5 PSI of boost. <laughs> 
Well, I think we're going to be ending it here tonight. There is some pretty cold weather coming tomorrow, and it's already getting pretty brutally cold in this garage. Apologies for some of the footage in this video. It has just, again, been brutally cold in this garage while we've been working and we've been trying to beat this weather that is upcoming. It also seems like a lot of this episode has been a lot of custom work that just depending on the project that you're doing, even if you are doing a KA24E in a 240SX or S13, it's probably just going to come down to whatever resources you have available to you. So we really can't give you a step-by-step -step guide on some of this stuff that we've been doing as much as we've been trying to. It's starting to seem very likely in the next episode in this series that we are going to be trying to turn over the engine and trying to get it running. So we wanted to thank you for being patient with us. We know this has been a pretty long series and some of these episodes have taken a while to get released. As well, thank you if you have even reached the end of this video in particular. It always helps with our analytics when people watch to the very end. At the time of filming, it is the holiday season, so we hope you have been enjoying your holidays with friends and family. Consider, if you haven't already, going over to our Instagram at team.blush and giving us a follow there. We do a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff, and when we're not releasing these episodes, we tend to try and do some posts over there to keep you guys updated on what we're working on. That is also the best way to get into contact with us if you have any questions, concerns, or just need to shoot us a message. With that, we're going to go inside and get something warm to eat and drink. We hope that you have a good day or night, depending on when you're watching this video. We hope to see you in the next channel on the the next channel on the series. We hope to see you in the next episode on the channel. And as always, take it easy.